My name is Garrett Madison. I'm an expedition leader, mountain guide, and climber. I've been guiding professionally in the mountains for 20 years. I've personally led more clients to the summit of Mount Everest over the course of 14 expeditions and counting than any other Western mountain guide. Mount Everest is a very special, beautiful, iconic, and magical place. If you're interested in climbing to the top of the world, here's a step-by-step -step guide to understanding Mount Everest. Before going to Everest, you should have the appropriate climbing experience, being familiar with the climbing equipment and being proficient on the appropriate terrain. Climbers gain these skills by climbing small, glaciated peaks. The high altitude element involves going to around 20,000 feet or higher and knowing that your body functions well. The expedition element would mean that you're comfortable going on an expedition for an extended period of time, away from your family and out of your comfort zone. Climbers can develop their own training program or work with a professional trainer who specializes in preparing climbers for Mount Everest. At a minimum, individuals should be on a training program six months before going to Everest. One of the most important decisions a climber will make is choosing which team they're going to climb with. There are fundamentally two types of companies that operate on Mount Everest. There's the non-guided logistics companies, and then there's the guided expedition companies. A non-guided logistics company provides all of the logistics necessary to make an attempt on the mountain, such as permits, transportation, food, base camp services, high camps, oxygen, and Sherpa support. With non-guided teams, individuals are climbing the mountain and making their own decisions. The disadvantage with a non-guided program is, if you don't have the appropriate experience to make decisions and manage your climb, you could get into trouble. A guided expedition is different in that you have an expedition leader and mountain guides who are overseeing the expedition and making the decisions for when to climb or turn around. A guided expedition is more expensive because the expedition is being managed by a professional, where everyone is climbing together and looking out for one another on the mountain from beginning to end. Generally, the team size will be limited to around 12 members. If somebody gets in trouble on a guided expedition, such as a gear malfunction, an illness, or the route becomes difficult, the team can work together to solve that problem and move forward. The expedition leader is constantly evaluating the conditions on the mountain, as well as the health of the climbers, to make sure that everyone is within their safety margin. This decision-making ability is part of what the climbers on a guided expedition pay for. The Nepal side and the Chinese side both have significant costs associated with attempting the peak. On the Nepal side, the royalty fee for the climbing is $11,000. That money goes straight to the government of Nepal. Climbers also have to factor in the cost to procure all of the equipment, tents, oxygen, food, and support staff. At the very low end, for a logistics-only, non-guided expedition, you might be able to pay as little as $35,000. For climbers joining a guided team, it's probably around $75,000. To go private, one-on-one -on -one with a Western Mountain Guide, it could cost upwards of $150,000. It's important to look at the experience and history of companies, expedition leaders, and mountain guides to evaluate who you want to climb with. There's a lot happening behind the scenes that makes climbing Mount Everest possible. Let's start with the weather. In general, the jet stream is over the region for much of the year. That means the winds can be in excess of 100 miles an hour at the top of Mount Everest. In late May, the monsoon starts to build in the Bay of Bengal to the south. The monsoon starts moving north, and that pressure system pushes the jet stream north, away from Mount Everest into China. Climbers have anywhere from a few days to a couple of weeks of good weather where the winds have calmed down and it's possible to climb to the summit. But the monsoon hasn't yet arrived in the Himalayas. Once the monsoon arrives, it begins snowing vast amounts every day. With lots of fresh snow, it becomes impossible to climb Everest. The ideal weather window is somewhere in early to late May. We plan around that in order to position all of our equipment and people so that when the weather window presents itself, we're ready to go on our summit attempt. The rope fixing project on Everest is generally done by one team. That involves bringing enough climbing rope and equipment and then moving that equipment up to base camp at the beginning of the season. The team of Sherpas, referred to as the Icefall Doctors, take responsibility for fixing the route from Everest Base Camp up to Camp 1. They use aluminum ladders, climbing rope, and anchors such as ice screws or snow pickets to install the route through the Kumbu Icefall all the way up to Camp 1. We're able to transport much of the equipment by helicopter up to Camp 2 and then start fixing lines from there. Hopefully they're able to complete the rope fixing by mid-May at the latest. There's two sides to Mount Everest, the north side and the south side. The north side is China, or Tibet. The south side is Nepal. The summit ridge is the border. 
In peak season on Everest, there's around 1,000 people in base camp. That's 380 foreign climbers on Everest permits, another 60 or 80 climbers on Lhotse permits, 400 climbing Sherpas, and then another couple hundred base camp support staff, cooks, porters, and helpers. Nepalese high-altitude climbers can be from different communities. We refer to these high-altitude workers collectively as Sherpas. Some teams do have their own medical support. However, it's much more common to pay a membership to the Everest ER base camp service. Teams have access to go see the physicians and have 24-hour support. In early April, we begin our expedition. The team assembles in Kathmandu. Then we fly into the Khumbu Valley to Lukla and begin the trek. Generally, this takes about a week to trek to Everest Base Camp. During that time, we're acclimatizing as we go higher. The trek to base camp is about 35 miles from start to finish. After we arrive in base camp, we spend about a full week there, reviewing all of the climbing techniques that we need to safely go up and down the mountain. We find an auspicious day on the Tibetan Buddhist calendar to do our puja ceremony, where we ask the mountain for safe passage. For the acclimatization process above base camp, we do two rotations. The first rotation, our team climbs up to camp one for a couple of nights, and then climbs up to camp two for a couple more nights, then descends back down to base camp. After a brief rest in base camp, we then go on our second rotation, where we climb up to camp two, spend the night, rest the next day, and then try to climb up to camp three on the Lhotse face at around 23,000 feet. Come back down to camp two to sleep, and then back down to Everest Base Camp. The next rotation will be our summit rotation. During that time, we're resting in base camp or sometimes a village below base camp. We're allowing our Sherpa team time to finish some of the load carries to stock the high camps with essential equipment such as fuel and oxygen. By mid-May, we're ready to begin our summit attempt. We're waiting to see that the winds will drop down to a reasonable speed and no significant storms or precipitation events in the forecast. Anywhere from two to four days of good weather with clear skies and calm winds that make for safe climbing. At Everest Base Camp, the route starts off by going into the Kumbu Icefall, through the crevasses and seracs, or ice towers, up to Camp 1 at about 19,400 feet. To get through the Kumbu Icefall, it's a series of ropes and ladders, which span crevasses and go over blocks of ice. From Base Camp to Camp 1, we're generally using crampons. We've got a climbing harness on. Attached to our climbing harness, we have an ascender, or jumar, and a safety carabiner, so that when we're climbing, we're able to clip into the fixed lines. We're using our crampons to climb up the steep glaciated slopes of ice. We're holding onto the fixed lines as we cross the ladder. Once we reach Camp 1, we're at the entrance of the Western Coombe. It's a long valley, a few miles from Camp 2, all the way up to the base of the Lhotse face, where Camp 2 is located. It's a gradual incline from Camp 1 up to the base of the Lhotse face, about a 2,000 foot vertical gain. Camp 2 is on a glacial moraine. We also call Camp 2 our advanced base camp. Climbers will stay in Camp 2 for an extended period to acclimatize. From here, we climb up to about 22,000 feet where the Lhotse face begins. Once we cross the Bergschrund, the crevasse at the base of the Lhotse face, we're on the steep ice. We climb all the way up to Camp 3 on fairly steep and hard terrain. Camp 3 is about 23,000 feet. From Camp 3, we climb more steep ice on the Lhotse face. Then we cross the Yellow Band, a prominent rock feature near 7,700 meters. Then we cross the Geneva Spur, a prominent rock ridge before arriving at the South Call, which is the saddle between Everest and Lhotse. Camp four is just under 8,000 meters. From there, we make our attempt at the summit. From camp four, we climb up the triangular face, then work our way up towards the balcony at 27,500 feet on the southeast ridge. Once we reach the south summit, we can look across the summit ridge towards the true summit of Everest. We climb up and over the area where the Hellery Step is, and then up onto the final cornice slope that leads to the top of the mountain, where the North Ridge, the West Ridge, and the Southeast Ridge all come together. Many people underestimate the amount of effort it takes to get down from the top of Everest. For that reason, and in general in mountaineering, most accidents occur on the way down. After we summit, we plan to go all the way back down to Camp 4 and spend the night there. The following day, we go from Camp 4 down to Camp 2 and spend the night. The next day, from Camp 2 down to base camp. Climbing Everest responsibly involves not only planning and preparing how to attempt the mountain in a safe way or how to get down without running out of energy, but also removing all of your equipment from the mountain, whether that's usable equipment or waste. 
Everest is a very iconic and magical place in the world, but with lots of people going up there, we do have an impact. It can seem like a daunting process for most people to attempt Mount Everest, but if it's something that you want to do, it's best just to start off climbing. Learn what it takes to climb a good-sized mountain and then find another bigger peak to attempt. It's definitely a challenge for everyone, but there's something about putting ourselves up against a big challenge, struggling with adversity, being outside of our comfort zone, and pushing ourselves to accomplish what we set out to do. It can facilitate enormous personal growth as well.